Um, my name is uh, Benjamin Penny. I'm the Deputy Director of the Australian Centre on China and the World. It's um, wonderful to welcome you here tonight. Um, first, as is customary, I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people, the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet this evening. Um, I'm not going to say very much, but I'll introduce, first of all, uh, Professor Jeremy Barmey, the Director of the Centre. Um, he will then speak and in turn introduce Dr. Ken Henry, who is going to launch our volume tonight. Dr. Henry, as I'm sure you're aware, is the Executive Chair of the ANU Institute of Public Policy, as well as being an advisor to the Prime Minister. Um, and uh, following Dr. Henry's remarks, Jeremy will speak again and uh, server willing, uh, we'll show you through the China Story website. Um, Dr. Richard Rigby, Professor Richard Rigby will say a few things following that and then we might depart into the foyer for refreshments. So I'll now hand over to Jeremy um, to continue this evening's uh, proceedings. Thank you, Ben. Ben is the Deputy Director of our Centre and as you probably know, the Centre was established in April 2010 by announcement made by the then Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd. The Centre was created to be an integrative research centre here at the ANU, building on the existing research capacity in this university. It came about because of um, a special undertaking involving the Commonwealth Government and the ANU, um, creating a new compact in which our former Vice-Chancellor Ian Chubb, who has graced us with his presence here today, was intimately involved in it. It was the creation of a collection of public policy and research-related institutes um, working at the ANU, somewhat like the Harvard, Business, uh, the, Harvard um, the Harvard School of Government, but also something quite unique to Australia. Um, we in the China world here had already established a China Institute, and building on that and with colleagues, we were able to articulate a particular approach to the study of the Chinese world or the Sinophone world, and that is a study that is led by um, the humanities engaged um, in multifarious ways with the social sciences, creating work that is research relevant and also relevant to a broader public and also to the policy community. And our centre has established itself in just that way, trying through its many programs, activities and the funding and support of postdoctoral fellows in particular, training the next, we hope, two generations of serious researchers who do just try to engage with that um, integrative approach to the Chinese world. Um, and we believe this is what we're trying to do. Today we've just had a sod turning, uh, the Dean of our College of Asia and the Pacific, which is the home of our Central, uh, Australian Centre on China in the world. Andrew McIntyre officiated, or well, Ben officiated, but Andrew turned the sod with Patricia Kelly from the department um, for our new building, which is just next to the law building and um, adjacent to the Sullivan's Creek. The building will be finished in November next year. As part of our, our aims in creating this centre, we wanted to not only build capacity, do all the things that are, that are expected of a research and edu education-oriented um, centre at an Australian tertiary institution, but also to try and demonstrate in practical ways how this type of research, research that is, as I said, humanities engaged, social sciences um, uh, relevant, as well as public policy informed, work is actually done. Earlier this year, we launched in Beijing on the 27th of February um, a report that we co-authored with one of China's major think tanks, the China Institutes of Contemporary International Relations, a bilateral report co-authored in both Chinese and English, the first report of its kind, the first report that Kika in Beijing, which is one of the major groups that advises the Politburo and State Council on International Affairs and Strategic Matters, the first report of the kind they've ever produced, co-authored and in both languages. Um, and that marked the beginning of our engagement with the 40th anniversary of the uh, re-establishment of relations between China and uh, the Commonwealth of Australia, or rather the establishment of relations between the People's Republic of China and Australia. But the way that we hope to show you all that we, we are trying to deal with the things we concern with, that is, how do we reach out to an interested and engaged public in Australia and internationally, using our expertise and our approach to the Chinese, the Chinese world and things Chinese in a practical fashion. And the concrete realisation of that is this project called the China Story Project. And I'll try if... Um, in a moment after, after we've introduced the book, um, I shall try and demonstrate uh, the website that we've launched today. I should advise you that there's a major hacking attack on the servers in Hong Kong that host the website. 
for other reasons, and uh, the site keeps on going, coming up and being turned off. Um, but this concretization of this project is in an annual work, the yearbook, the China Story yearbook, and we're launching today the first volume in, that, in our series, Red Rising, Red Eclipse. And I'll say a bit more about how you can get access to it and how it's going to work. And we'll also, in a moment, um, we'll have copies of it available to you outside. But um, without further ado, I'll ask a very special guest, Dr. Ken Henry, who has been introduced by Ben Penny here, to say a few words. We're delighted that um, you found the time to join us today and you've been able to look at the site, look at the demonstration site, and also have some time to look at the book. So thank you so much, Dr. Henry. Well, thank you very much, uh, and it's a, a pleasure uh, to have the opportunity to be here with you this evening to launch the China Story Yearbook 2012, Red Rising, Red Eclipse. I want to take you back. Well, actually, I want to take myself back because you weren't there. In the, but I was. In the early 1980s, the very early 1980s, I was a young lecturer in economics at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. Uh, the economics faculty that that university had a reputation for free market thinking. In fact, um, I remember we thought of ourselves in those days as uh, the Chicago University Economics Department of the Southern Hemisphere. That's how right-wing that place was. Um, and uh, somewhat um, paradoxically, although maybe the two things are related, these were the last years of New Zealand's Muldoon government. Now, it's doubtful that any democracy in the post-World War II era has ever had a more statist regime than that, was that which was established by Sir Robert Muldoon. Almost everything, apart from the press and the universities, and even there uh, the question needed to be asked, almost everything was under central control. And if it wasn't under central control, it acted as if it was. There was hardly a business anywhere in the country that didn't consider that it owed its survival to the patronage of the Muldoon government. And that patronage was delivered through such things as a managed exchange rate, politically controlled monetary policy, an extraordinarily elaborate set of import controls, uh, even more elaborate set of exclusive licensing arrangement, uh, and an unbelievable set of taxpayer subsidies. This is just the early 1980s. So much has happened in the intervening years, especially in New Zealand, of course, that it's hard to believe that the degree of central control could have been so high. But it certainly was. The Muldoon government decided who could buy and or sell any good or any service that you might want to name. Uh, and if they liked you, you not only got the licence to operate, you also got absolute control over your potential competitors. Seriously, it was up to you whether anybody else could get a licence to operate in the same market. And on top of that, you got a nice subsidy as well. Well, in the economics faculty of the University of Canterbury, when people spoke of the Politburo, they were not referring to the central organs of the CCCP or the CCP. They were referring to the cabinet of the New Zealand government. Why do I recall this? Well, one day, in these early years of the 1980s, into this economics faculty seminar room, walked a senior Chinese academic. I attended the seminar thinking that I was going to get a lesson in an alternative model of socialist market economics. And in fact, I think that's what the seminar topic was, something about socialist market economics. But along with everybody else in the room, I got a big shock. Our visitor outlined for us a vision of a future Chinese economy and a set of pathways toward that vision that all of us found both difficult to believe and very appealing. We were impressed. At the end of the seminar, one of my colleagues, and I remember seeing this, encouraged our Chinese visitor to seek an audience with the New Zealand Prime Minister to give him a lesson in free market economics. <laughs> All of that is a long time ago. The vision outlined to that group of academics then has not yet been realised. There's still a long way to go. But China is much further down the pathway as described for us then than any of my colleagues would have considered plausible. Indeed, today... China is considerably closer to a model free market economy than New Zealand was in the early 1980s. Now that doesn't mean that the full vision will ever be realised. And while in the early 1980s that would not have been considered 
an enormously important matter for anybody other than the Chinese people themselves. Today, that is a vitally important matter for all of the world's people. With so many steps having been taken down those pathways, the direction in which the next set of steps is taken is now a very serious matter for everybody on the planet. Today, China has the largest population and second largest economy in the world. It is by far Australia's most significant trading partner. There are more than 30 other countries from all around the world that would list China as their largest export destination. And there are perhaps 40 countries from all around the world that would list China as their principal source of imports. And by the way, that includes New Zealand. China has the world's largest army and the second largest defence budget. It is a nuclear state. It has the second highest number of billionaires measured in US dollars. The Shanghai Stock Exchange is ranked fifth in the world. China also has by far the largest holdings of foreign exchange reserves, including, importantly, US dollar denominated reserves, about three times the holdings of Japan, Japan being the next highest reserves accumulator. It's taken the developed world a very long time to realise that these reserves constitute a strategic asset. And for those familiar with the debate about financial market manipulation that followed the Asian financial crisis of the late 1990s, there's been considerable irony in the spectacle of industrialised economies seeking Chinese support in bailing out their distressed financial institutions in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, something that would more accurately be labelled the non-Asian financial crisis. For reasons that are not at all easy to understand, a lot of the consequences of China's re-emergence as a global power in economic terms, in social terms and in strategic dimensions appear to have caught a lot of people by surprise. My guess is that the surprises are not over. Even if the Chinese development journey continues to proceed down those attractive pathways described 30 years ago, and of course, if those pathways become obstructed or deviations are preferred by those in power, then the surprises could be even larger with much more serious consequences. There's a lot riding on this. New Zealand has also changed a lot in the past 30 years. Even 20 years ago, within only a few years of regime change in New Zealand, that country was widely regarded as having one of the world's most liberal market economies. As a subject for economic transformation, the New Zealand of the early 1980s had some obvious advantages. A small population spread across a relatively small landmass, a unitary state with a unicameral parliament, reasonable infrastructure connections, a world-class education system, English language proficiency, a strong banking system, a strong and transparent legal system, low levels of corruption. For the economic reformer, China's position today doesn't look anywhere near as promising on any of these capability metrics as New Zealand did 30 years ago. Yet on the other hand, China has achieved a good deal more than New Zealand or indeed any other country in the intervening period. For example, while New Zealand's GDP per capita has almost tripled in purchasing power parity terms, in that same time period China's has grown about 20-fold. Indeed, China's performance on most of the aggregate economic metrics typically used by analysts has been unprecedented. And it's had many, mainly very positive, spillover consequences for other countries, especially other countries in the region, and that includes Australia. But as I've indicated, what really matters for all of us are the steps that are now taken by China. And the China Story Yearbook 2012, Red Rising, Red Eclipse, provides a sense of the enormity of the issues that will have to be managed. Indeed, will have to be managed very well if the next 30 years of China's development are to be as positive for the world as the past 30. Red Rising Red Eclipse assists with an understanding of a set of issues that the modern China has been grappling with for 30 years, in some cases for a lot longer than that. These issues remain unresolved and some are becoming more acute. Thus, for example, a more assertive foreign policy posture has a lot of people wondering about China's territorial ambitions. Rising income inequality is between the rapidly urbanising east and the still largely rural west poses a threat to social stability. Rapid urbanisation has created a set of issues of congestion and other externalities. Water security, food security and energy security 
now dominate policy thinking, and for good reason. Demographic challenges loom. The digital age challenges the effectiveness of centralised control mechanisms, while at the same time providing leaders, and indeed aspiring leaders, with a window on China that was previously not available to anybody. And who knows how good any of the numbers are anyway. These are some of the issues highlighted in the China Story Yearbook 2012. It's a resource that should be of interest to anyone wanting to understand the trajectory of China's future. And that really should be everyone who takes an interest in their own future. So it's with great pleasure that I launched the China Story Yearbook 2012 Red Rising Red Eclipse. Now, if I may, um, I've just been in constant touch with our colleagues in Beijing who have helped us design and create the website that goes with this project. Um, there's been what's called a, a distributed denial of service attack on the server in Hong Kong where the site is located. Um, that is the type of attack most commonly used and you know, public media's notes most commonly used by anonymous. Um, it means that hundreds or thousands of computers are visiting the server at exactly the same moment which crashes the server. Um, this is the server that serves many other companies and groups. So our site, I won't bother fiddling and doing the classic, let me show you a website and it won't work on screen type of um, demonstration here. I'll just say a few words about what will eventually be a live site. The site was alive, alive and then prematurely murdered um, half an hour ago. Um, the site which goes with this book, the book, as I said, we'll have copies of the book outside. The book is organized around thematics. There's the chapters on... Um, they're all guys around our, our research themes. The way that we've organized our center is uh, using um, interdisciplinary approaches to all the issues to do with uh, regional politics, economics, social change, internet, intellectual debate, everyday life, urban development, and so on and so forth. And we try and bring these strands, these concerns, which are on one level academically chopped up into disciplines, into a type of practical conversation. And the way we do it is, in, as you'll see in this book, is in way we've done this book, um, and you, you'll get copies in a moment that will demonstrate that. The site itself, the website um, called thechinastory.org, is organized to provide this text, and the text is um, a cross-platform uh, work. That means on the site you can download, well, those can actually can download the whole book in PDF form as a book. You can download um, any of the chapters as individual chapters. You can download the whole text as some um, uh, an e-reader or an e-book to be published on demand or as a Kindle reader or it can be read as just a PDF file. So we've used all methods of um, electronic distribution to create this text as long as the servers are working. Um, so and in particular because we, we are a publicly funded center here at the ANU, we believe very much in providing the type of research that we do not only through the usual academic channels of peer-reviewed journals and books, which are crucially important, but also through methods such as this book and the, the website, which provide no, um, non-paywall restricted um, access to our work. The website not only has the book, and we, as I said, we're preparing, well, I didn't say, we're preparing next year's volume called Civilizing China. It's already underway, and we hope to launch that in uh, August July or August next year. So it'll be a smaller volume because this work, uh, Red Rising, Red Eclipse, covers the years 2009 to 2012. The website also features a number of other things. There's a blog. Our first blog entries have been launched. The blog is run by our postdoctoral fellows in our center um, with their collaborators overseas. The, the person who came up with the idea is actually a Beijing and Shenzhen-based Italian scholar who works on Chinese labor rights. And he's also a documentary filmmaker and um, writer in his own right, even Franceschini, and he's working with our postdoctoral fellows to continue this operation. Like everything else in our center, we have a foot in many camps. Um, this, this website and this book were created, this design, this design was done by um, our colleague uh, Marcus Vernley in Kyoto, who's Japan-based and will soon be ANU-based. The cover image is done by a um, former Yale professor of photography who's based in New York, Lois Connor. Uh, the actual markers did the design, but much of the um, research work and information, there's lots of information annexes and windows in the book, they were put together primarily by our collaborators in Beijing, the Dunway group, which is a group that um, has done market research as well as academic research and runs um, a blog on Chinese internet and media politics, culture and society. They've been our research arm in Beijing for two years now. 
And we have, as we've developed our center, created a large intranet site with the help of Dunway. It's an, we only have, we alone through password protection have access to that site, and it's developed a large archive of materials related to all of our research themes and the major issues to do with contemporary Chinese politics, life, culture, social development change, and urban change. Um, that archive itself is reformulated. We've, we're putting, we're releasing with this website part of the archive um, today uh, that's been put together with Dunway. So that's also on our website. So there's the blog. There is which we have two or three entries per week on the blog. There's, um, and it's aimed, like many of the things I've worked on in the past, it's aimed at particularly training younger scholars and people to write for a broader public while also underpinning their work with scholastic information and, and, um, and, um, and um, rigorous research. The blog, the yearbook, the archive, and then we have what's called the China Story Lexicon. The lexicon, we've only, this far, um, thus far as today, we issued six lexicon items. The China story is, that's very crudely put, is now that China, the People's Republic of China, represents itself internationally as a particular type of country with a global presence, with a particular type of history, a reappearance on the global stage, the Chinese authorities, the party state, that is that intermingling of officialdom and um, state mechanisms, represents itself through a particular kind of narrative. And when we globally encounter the China issues, um, when um, we encounter the China story, there are always recurring themes and topics of public interest. And they are such things as the South China Sea, the renminbi and its convertibility, issues to do with human rights, Tiananmen Square, the events of 1989, Falun Gong, Taiwan, Hong Kong, cross-strait relations, and so on and so forth. All of these um, press button, these, these hot button words that have such crucial importance. What we're doing with the lexicon is over time building up a body of material that does the following. It, um, offers the official Chinese view of a particular topic. The lexicon items we've released today are Xinjiang, Renminbi, human rights, labor, and uh, the internet, and Chinese political discourse, these six items. Each one offers the official Chinese view of this particular issue. Renminbi, for example, gives us the full official Chinese view of the last five years of how the Renminbi is seen, what the issues are related to so-called currency manipulation, so on and so forth. Then it offers internal Chinese debate and discussion on this topic. It then offers international dissenting Chinese voices and views of the same topic, then international uh, media representations of discussions of the topic, in terms of the Renminbi, it's mostly American-based discussions with other international commentators, and then a series of discussions and information um, materials related to the broader questions of currency and so on and so forth. So each, and that material was written by our colleague Jane Golly, who's here with us today, and so each item in the lexicon provides this range of views with web links, uh, bibliography, and other information, and glossary, as well as a timeline that will aid anybody who wants to know what in heaven's name is. Every time I hear about Xinjiang, what are the issues to do with Xinjiang? You can come to our site and you will at least have the major variant views with the scholastic detail, the bibliographical references, the online references, official reports, dissenting views available at your fingertips. And we want to, over time, build up 30 or 40 of these key items. We're not a Wikipedia. It's not mass-sourced. This is research-paced work that reaches out to a broader engaged public. And that's who we try to work with as well. That is the engaged, interested public, which is really the people who support the work of researchers and the people who we believe, because of the very presence of China, its importance in the bilateral relationship, in, in this very particular bilateral relationship, speaking to that public and being able to address it in ways that are comprehensible are incredibly important for us to do. And this China story is part of an attempt to do just that. It's something that we here in the College of Asia and Pacific the ANU try in very many ways to do, and ours is just one of the many adventures and attempts to do this. So there's the lexicon. And then there's another resource called the Australia China Story. And this is still a draft part of the site, but it offers an overview um, from our report with Kika of the history of Australia-China relations since the gold rush. Very short overview. Um, then a bibliography of all the major works um, and websites to do with Australian Chinese history. But then more practically, it introduces first the work that our own centre has produced in relation to China and Australia. And then it goes on to offer the last, it offers an overview of the last two months of debates in the Chinese, Australian media and Chinese responses to issues to do with Tony Abbott's visit to China, Bob Carr's visit to China, defense issues, and so on and so forth. So there's those, each issue is, um, collates under a specific topic, collates material related to that particular issue over the last few months. 
Then beyond that, the last two or three years, we have a bibliography of all the major debates and discussions in our media with the Chinese responses and engagements on issues to do with the 2009 Defense White Paper, to do with um, overseas direct investment, and so on and so forth. So it is really a, a resource for people to use. It also offers all the links to all the major political statements made on China by our leaders um, and our opposition leaders. It provides also links to all the major sites that relate to the Australia-China relationship, um, both Chinese, Australian government, non-official embassy, and so on and so forth. So it's one of those resources that we hope over time will become um, a part of the national conversation, something that people in the media and the general public will be able to use. Um, there's many other aspects to the site. I won't go into them. But I can't demonstrate it, but I've already probably bored in words. I mean, one picture would be worth a thousand words. To use a, Chinese, a really Chinese cliche. But that's the aim of the site, is to bring research into the public domain, free and accessible, we're not being hacked, um, for the use of the Australian and the international public. And this um, yearbook, as I said, is the crystallization of these efforts. It'll be an annual, an annual event. Uh, but our, own, our blog and other um, things, the lexicon and the, the, um, the archive, as well as the Australian China Story, will continue to unfold and be updated constantly. And we have actually the usual range of Facebook, Twitter, and our RSS feeds that push out information even to those unwitting people who really want it. But thank you so much. I would now conclude and ask where's Ben Pinders? Ben, you'd like to say? Um, ben was, I was going to get Ben to introduce Richard. Yeah. <laughs> well, then we were going to ask the, uh, one of the key colleagues who works in our management group. Our centre is run here at the ANU in the College of Asia and the Pacific. There are five ANU colleagues. Richard Rigby, who's the head of our, the executive director of our ANU China Institute, is a member of our management group. But our management group also has five non-ANU people. That is academics at universities in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, um, Adelaide and Tasmania. We are, I believe, I don't believe, I know, we are an, a national institution. Our major intellectual direction, research priorities and budgetary issues are discussed collectively and decided collectively. And we really do try and pursue a national uh, remit in our work. Among, that, among the, the things that make us a national center is that we've created a, a, Chinese, a resources for Chinese studies program that supports through um, either matching grants or small grants, conferences, workshops, and visits um, to other universities and supports the work in Chinese studies at institutions around this country. But I won't go on more about our center. I'd just like to ask Richard to say a few words in conclusion. Thank you, Richard. As Jeremy's indicated, I wear two, two hats, one the China Institute hat, the other CIW. Wearing the CIW hat, I've just come from a two-week course that we've been running for public servants, which is an important part of our outreach and the public policy aspects of what we do. And I'm very pleased to note that uh, a number of the survivors of our course are here this afternoon. Um, I'd have to say, with reference to Dr. Henry's remarks, that he, uh, he's in grave danger of being asked to contribute a chapter to next year's yearbook. Uh, and in fact, I think he might have done if somebody's taken careful note of what he said. <laughs> you get a hang ahead of me, Jeremy. Um, one of the things that I, one of the themes that I've been stressing in this course, the public servants, is my concern, which I think is shared by a number, uh, that we have two narratives in Australia about China. But we have a an economic and trade narrative, and we have a national security narrative. We should have a single Australian narrative which brings all these elements together. We don't. Colleagues from foreign affairs, some of whom are also represented here today, do their very best, and I think we should uh, give them credit for what they do. But I'm talking about the overall discussion, debate we have in Australia about China, and it's we still a lot of work needs to be done bringing it together. This book goes some of the way to do that. One of the other things I said in the course was that when we think about China, we can't just think about China and Australia. We have to think about China in the overall context of Asia, because we are not just looking at the rise of China. We're looking at the rise of Asia or the return of Asia. Australia is in a unique position. We came about as a result of the maritime supremacy of the, of the Royal Navy. That's why we're here. That's why we speak English. Those days are now moving away. Things are changing. So when we think about China, we need to think about the overall Asian context. And in that regard, the work that Dr. Henry is doing uh, for the government is of particular importance. And I think any Australian who cares about the future of our country will need to pay great attention to what uh, comes out of the Henry report, the white paper. Um, and because of that, 
I think we can all we can all guess at just how very very busy Dr Henry has been and is and will continue to be, uh, which makes us all the more grateful for him being able to spare the time to come to us and give this extremely enlightening address and to launch the book. So I'd like to ask everybody to join me in thanking Dr Henry for launching the book.